I have everybody I know, in, especially my family, <coughs> praying for me this morning because I have not taught since last summer. And, um, and I mean, I've actually said to the Lord, Lord, do I, do I still have the gift of teaching? And then I remember a verse about that. And, um, and I was reading Hebrews not long ago, and, it, and I can't, ran across the verse, neglect not the gift that is in you. And so I've been asking the Lord since then, well, it's very comfortable not teaching. I, I can sleep through the night. I don't have to worry about <laughs> having everything done to perfection. And then Ron asked me to do this, and I said, Lord, really? <laughs> do I really need to do this? And uh, so this is kind of a test for me, and maybe a test for you to have to endure it. But, um, but I'm glad you're here. I was wondering if anybody would show up knowing Ron was out of town. And, and we'll be back next week doing the same thing, but a different passage in, in uh, Colossians. So um, I'm counting on the Lord this, this morning as I never have before, and I presume you might be too because you don't want to sit through a, a fruitless hour. So <laughs> let's open with prayer. Lord, it's just amazing how you bring us together in one body in your church and that you keep reminding us that... We are your church and that we are called together in a spirit of love and oneness to worship you, to study your word, to have fellowship together. This has been a place of profound blessing for many, many of us for many years. And for some of us, it's somewhat new, but your body is one body in Christ and we are so grateful. Your word is inspired by your spirit, and we who have trusted you as Lord and Savior have the powerful indwelling presence of your Holy Spirit, so that as we study together this morning, we should be hearing words from you that are appropriate to each one of us individually, uh, to the call that you've given us to serve you, uh, to the truth that you have planted in our minds and in our hearts. And we pray, Lord, that all this working together is going to make us into an even stronger, more powerful witness for you in this city and, and in places beyond our borders. Uh, we pray for those who are attending the conference uh, uh, of, of ECO this morning, and, and we pray that you would especially bless them and bring them all back to their respective churches uh, filled with, uh, with your spirit, filled with enthusiasm, filled with love for one another. But as we are here in this room, Lord, and we've already prepared our hearts to some extent in our groups, uh, we ask that you would uh, fill me with your spirit uh, and help me, Lord, to concentrate and to speak the words that you want me to speak and to forget those words that are not appropriate for me to speak. May this be a very productive morning together, Lord. Uh, we thank you for the privilege of being here and we thank you for the privilege of being part of your magnificent family. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Uh, two things, remember the congregational meeting this Sunday all members need to be there. It's very important. And then also remember that this Sunday is loaves and fishes. Uh, we meet downstairs in the kitchen down below on the first level. Uh, isn't it three o'clock? Three o'clock we start to feed. Three o'clock we start to feed, but that means that those who are serving gather earlier. If you have never, you don't have to be a member of this church to participate in loaves and fishes. Um, I will tell you this, that when my kids come for Christmas uh, from out of town, the first thing they ask is, is your church serving loaves and fishes while we're here? One year, um, Karen and Kent, uh, her husband and their six kids came, and we went to loaves and fishes. And um, we sat around our dining room table just before they were to leave. And, uh, and, their, and George asked them, what was the most favorite thing you did here in San Antonio while you were home for Christmas or here for Christmas? 
and they all in unison said, love's the fishes. And these were young kids and, and older kids. Uh, so it's a blessing. It really is a blessing. You might not be able to come and stay, but if not, you're welcome to bring food. And if you have no food, you're welcome to come and serve. It's just, uh, it, it's just wonderful. People line up outside this church starting at least an hour early. And um, it's, it's just one of the high points of the week when you, when you get to do it. All right, so that's loaves and fishes, congregational meeting. Anything else? Jay's concert on the 4 o'clock. Oh, we always interfere with, with Jay's concert. Jay is doing a concert at 4 in the afternoon. And if you've, you know, some of you are not from this church. If you've never heard Jay Ha on the organ, you've missed it. Incarnate Word, though. Oh, it's Incarnate Word. It's not even here. Well, that's how much I know. Um, incarnate Word in that chapel. Oh, wow. It's going to be beautiful. Mm -hmm. Okay, Barbara Ann says, officer nominating committee for this church is, is meeting now, I mean in this period of time, and if you have suggestions for elder or deacon, are there forms available in the yes, there Mosaic there Lobby? Yes, in the Mosaic Lobby. You can also download the form from the website. Okay. And um, if you don't want to do either of those, you want to type something on your computer and send it to me by email. Are you chair of the committee? Bless you. Okay, if you have anyone you want to nominate to be an officer of this church, that is really, really important. Uh, so see Barbara Ann Stevens and fill out one of those forms. Uh, I want to thank you, first of all, for your prayers during my long illness. I have not taught since last summer, and it's uh, my heart's beating. <laughs> Will I ever be able to do it again? I, you know, that's not for me to decide, but at any rate, uh, I'm not yet healed from the infection. It's an infection that the infectious disease doctor said uh, could take at least a year to heal. He said it's possible it won't heal. So I'm on a very strong antibiotic and I'll just stay on it indefinitely. Ken Kruger told me sitting in Sunday school Sunday morning, don't get off of it. He had a friend who had the same thing and he got off of the antibiotic and the infection came back. So. Anyway, I am making progress, and I do thank you for your prayers. Um, now, open your Bibles to Colossians 1, verses 15 to 23. Uh, it would have been nice if Eco had chosen another time to meet where we wouldn't be in this particular passage. I think, I mean, it's a great passage, but for me, this is difficult. I don't know. Is it difficult for any of you? I mean, to get the meat of it, it it's, it's deep. It's deep. So, um, if you remember nothing else, these two passages, that's, that is the Colossians passage we study today, and then I'm going to read to you John 1, verses 1 to 5. They're about the deity and the supremacy of Christ. And if you remember no other passages about the deity and supremacy of Jesus Christ, Remember these. Write them in the back of your Bible or someplace where you won't forget. Um, here's what John 1, verses 1 to 5, has to say. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him, that is Jesus, all things were made, and without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that light was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. We usually hear this at Christmas time, but this is a passage to lock in your memory and combine it with this passage from Colossians. Now, Paul is writing to the Colossians, as you recall, because of heresy. Heresy had crept into the church. And I just want to make this comment. We're still in danger of heresy creeping into the church today. Whether this church or any other church. 
if we're not careful, we let down our guard and we start believing things that are only partly true or not at all true and we get off track. What was the Colossian heresy? False teaching had crept into the church and it was called syncretism. Syncretism is a word you should remember. It's combining ideas from other philosophies and religions and combining it with Christianity, such as paganism, strains of Judaism, and Greek thought. It's like pouring all this in a mixing bowl and you come out with syncretism. And we should never be guilty of that in this church. We should guard what we hear, we should guard what is being taught and listen carefully to what is being preached. The most dangerous aspect of the Colossian heresy was its depreciation of the person of Jesus Christ. To those teaching heresy in Colossae, Christ was not the triumphant redeemer to whom all authority in heaven and on earth had been committed. At best, he was only one of many spirit beings who bridged the space between God and man. So the scripture we are studying today is part of Paul's answer to this heretical teaching. So to refresh our memories, let's read through this again. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. It's easy for me to remember by him, but to remember that all that he has created is for him shows a different sheds a different light on it um, he is before all things and in him all things hold together we remember that from Genesis 1 but we're not going to go there right now and he is the head of the body the church he is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Now, in parentheses, remember this passage from Hebrews 9, verse 21. The law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Now, a comment I want to make is we're living in a time in our own country where there's a lot of syncretism. There's a lot of heresy. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Takes away this idea that we are going to get to heaven by being good, or with our best self-effort, God will be pleased with us. We are all sinners, all condemned to be separated from God for eternity, except through Jesus Christ and his shed blood. Now, going on with verse 21 in Colossians 1. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. If you remember the background of the church at, at Colossae before they were a church, they were involved, as were all those cities in that, in that area, they were involved in, in idol worship. And so now they have turned from that. But when they were involved in idol worship and calling other things gods, uh, they were alienated from God. And they were enemies 
in their minds because of their evil behavior. Evil behavior is going to be a natural outcome of being separated from God. Verse 22, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. Think of the worst thing you have done in your whole life, whether others know about it or not. Think of that thing that you hope that nobody ever finds out about you. Through Christ and his cleansing, in Christ's presence, we are free from accusation. But here's the big if in verse 23. If you continue in your faith, established and firm, not moved from the hope held out in the gospel, if you continue in your faith. Uh, the writer to the Hebrews has something to say about that, which we don't have time to go into today. But I, I'm, if clauses in the scripture always make me nervous. Because salvation is free, but there's an expectation when you receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and, and receive forgiveness for your sins. There's an expectation that you follow him as his disciple and continue in your faith established and firm, not moved from the hope held out by the gospel. This is the gospel that you heard that has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a servant. If, if you want to meet somebody who had a lot of things to regret and had a reputation that was absolutely horrible, think about Paul before he was converted on the Damascus Road. He was out killing Christians. He was putting them in prison. There was a lot that Paul wished he hadn't done, but he's been cleansed just like we have been if we know Christ. Now, in, in, there, in this passage, there are three sweeping statements concerning Christ. These show Christ's relation to deity. One, Christ is the image of the invisible God. 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Paul is not teaching that Christ is the image of God in a material or physical sense. The true meaning must be sought on a deeper level than this. Nor should we limit the concept to one stage or period of Christ's existence. Christ always has been, is, and always will be the image of God. His incarnation did not make him the image of God, but it did bring him as being that image within our grasp. How is Christ the image of God? In the Greek, there are two ideas for image. One is likeness. Christ is the image of God in the sense that he is the exact likeness of God like an image on a coin or the reflection in a mirror. Hebrews 1, verses 1 to 3 says this. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, and we are all in the last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom he made the universe. Now take that into your college science class. <laughs> the sun, verse 3, the sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. Now the other idea is manifestation. That is, God is the image of God in the sense that the nature, nature and being of God are perfectly revealed in Jesus. Um, I want to stop here and make a comment. I'll probably say it again before we're finished. Um, 
when someone says to you, but we all worship the same God, true or not? No. You cannot, you cannot eliminate Jesus Christ from the Godhead and still worship the same God. As a matter of fact, before I started preparing this lesson, I got um, an email from my daughter Karen in Virginia. And she sent me an article from the Washington Post about a professor at Wheaton College who may or may not be relieved of her responsibilities at Wheaton because she was quoted as saying, we all believe in the same God. That's not the gospel. It is not. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry she's going through this, but I'm glad they caught her on that because that is not a biblical statement. Um, the idea of manifestation is that Christ is the image of God in the sense that the nature and being of God are perfectly revealed in him. John 1.18, no one has ever seen God but God, the one and only, who is at the Father's side, has made him known. John 14, 1 to 14, Jesus is talking with his disciples. He says, do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God, trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I am going there to prepare a place for you. <coughs> And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me so that you also may be where I am. <clears throat> you know the way to the place I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you are going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, and this was one of the first verses I memorized as a little kid. My, in fact, my brother was memorizing to get points to go to camp. Mm -hmm. And I was his little sister who stood beside him as he was quoting, you know, reciting this to my mother. So I learned it, <laughs> and it's never left me. Verse John, uh, John 14, verse 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You cannot take Jesus out of the equation and still have salvation. It, just, it, it won't work. If you really knew me, you would know my father as well. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Philip said, Lord, show us the father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip, even after I have been among you for such a long time? Listen to this. Anyone has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and that the Father is in me? The words I say to you are not just my own. Rather, it is the Father living in me. <clears throat> That's amazing. We have Jesus as believers. We have Jesus living in it, in us. And Jesus says the Father is living in me. Who is doing his work? Believe me when I say I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Or else believe the evidence of the miracles themselves. I tell you the truth. Anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. Go, go home and read that and think about that. That's a, that's a mouthful. I mean, that's profound. Anyone who has, who has faith in me will do what I have been doing. So I've been asking for years, so how come the church is so weak in doing the things that Jesus did when he was here? He says, Jesus says, I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Son may bring glory to the Father. You may ask me for anything in my name, and I will do it. Now, we're going on to verse 18. Christ is the head of the church. 
Verse 18, and he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. What does it mean to be head of the church? Jesus Christ, as head of the church, is its chief leader. That's why no church that is really a church can eliminate Jesus Christ from their message of the gospel and still be a church. It is Jesus Christ who guides and governs the church. He, in the scripture here, is emphatic. The meaning being that Christ alone, Christ and no other, is head of the church. The church, which means assembly or congregation, is best interpreted here as a term embracing all the redeemed people of God. So think about that for a minute. All the redeemed people of God. How wide is that in, 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 in its... What is encompassed by that statement? Believers all over the world, right? Not just Fourth and Alamo. We are the congregation, we are the body of Jesus Christ, joined together with every believer in the world. Every believer in Jesus Christ. Church, which means assembly or congregation, includes all of us. It's true, we have people come into our church, or your church if you're from another church, and ask to join the church to be a member of their church, as if they belong over there, we belong over here, and there are others who belong at various places around the world. But when we are joined together in one body in Jesus Christ, there is only one church, and we are part of it. Paul speaks to this in the first chapter of 1 Corinthians, where the Corinthians are having a real problem an identity crisis by saying, I'm of Paul, I'm of, I'm of uh, Cephas, I'm, I'm of so-and-so and so-and-so. And so. They all have their leader. When I read 1 Corinthians 1, I'm thinking denominations. What we say to them, I'm Presbyterian, I'm Lutheran, I'm Baptist. And, you know, depending on who you're talking to, you dare not mention some of these denominations because uh, they'll put a check by your name, you're not. There is only one body of Christ, and every believer in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior is part of his body, and they're part of us, whatever church they belong to. So we have to keep that in mind. And I know with the issues we've had in this church recently that I hope and pray are now, are now settled, um, we, are, we are one. We are one with the people who were here. We are one with the people who have left. We are one with our brothers and sisters around the city who are worshiping Jesus in churches by other names. We are all one in Christ. Being one in Christ, or using the word church, suggests at least three things. The church is a living organism composed of members joined vitally to one another. You might hate me for saying this, but I'm going to say it. So how is it then, how is it that sometimes we have to leave this church and go somewhere else? Are we not denying the definition of the church? Are we still believers in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? Are those who have left this body of Christ and have gone elsewhere, in their eyes, are we no longer members of the body of Christ? Are they no longer members of the body of Christ? We are joined in one. And we can't break that union. If we have sincerely placed our trust in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of our sins, 
and we worship Jesus Christ as Lord, there's no reason to leave. And if you're somewhere else, you might really enjoy staying there if you are also worshiping the same Jesus Christ. We are one body, united in Christ. The church is a living organism composed of members joined vitally to one another. The church is the means by which Christ carries out his purposes and performs his work. It has nothing to do with the denomination, the, the, what you have on your letterhead, whether you're Presbyterian, Baptist, Lutheran, whatever. The church is the means by which Christ carries out his purposes and performs his work. And it takes all of us working together all over this city and in foreign countries to get that work done. And Ron and uh, I was going to say our pastors. Well, there's I don't know if the Scots downstairs or not. We're, we're short on pastors. Anyway, that's where Ron is. They are meeting with the new denomination that we have joined, and and they are discussing how we can be most effective witnesses for Jesus Christ. The union that exists between Christ and His people is most intimate and real. I've received some emails from some members of this congregation, I think they're still members, who have written and just simply said, since we left the church, we miss you all terribly. I'm frankly, I'm glad. And if I ever left this church because I was mad at you for something, I, I, really, I really hope you would go after me and get me to come back. Uh, there is a relationship, not by our own liking of one another or always agreeing with each other. It is through the blood of Jesus Christ. We are joined together in one. And if we, cho if we choose to go worship somewhere else, then I pray that you'll be going to do Christ's work wherever you go. But keep, keep working because we're still part of Christ's body. You can't leave this church and not be a part of Christ's body if you're a part of Christ's body now. And the reverse is true. So I think we need to remember who we belong to. <coughs> Together we all constitute one living unit in the sense of being incomplete without the other. Uh, we have a couple of minutes now. A couple of you said, no, don't open it for questions. <laughs> um, do you have comments or questions? And I'm going to go back to the one I, I raised by, by this week professor. <clears throat> I'm anxious to see what they do with her. This is not typical of Wheaton for anyone on that faculty to say. Oh, I just think that uh, I was mentioning that you mentioned through the blood of Jesus yes. periodically in your message. And that refers to the occasion of Jesus dying on the cross for our sin. Amen. Okay. Amen. And, and in the Old Testament, it is repeated without the shedding of blood. There is no remission for sins. In the Old Testament, the reason for the sacrifices was to come before God with the shedding of blood, an appropriate animal without spot. A sacrifice given to God on behalf of the people because of their sin. Um, I think... I'm glad that we have the, the, the prayer of confession uh, in our church on Sunday morning. It's important. But I hope that that continues throughout the week and every week because there's not a day that goes by that I don't have a list. Even a, even a passing thought or, or an unhealthy motive or an unkind word, whatever it is, I have to come into Jesus' presence and ask for forgiveness. But I can do it, and I can do it freely and confidently, not because of anything I have done, but because Jesus died on the cross to pay for those sins. And in the Old Testament, 
the sacrificial system, which is spelled out meticulously in the Old Testament of what, how, what the Jews were to do, um, you cannot come into God's presence with sin. You can't. But you don't have to because Jesus has already paid the price. Any other comments? Um, I might I might mention this, <coughs> a couple things uh, because of that article that Karen sent me and Wheaton is dear and dear to my heart. What that professor said: We all worship the same God. You answer this: Do we worship the same God if someone slices Jesus Christ out of the deity? Now, you say that because in our society, oh, I no, 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 Good. no, please, please, <coughs> say it. In our society, pick people, may I say, people pick to choose what they want to love. And since we're all not loving the same thing, we're all not loving the same God. Right. Pardon me? Well, you ask all the religions of the world and they'll, they'll give you a list. But there, the scripture is clear, there is only one God. And so, um, and we are accountable to him. This passage talks about, about removing blemishes, uh, sin. When we come into Christ's presence because he already shed his blood on the cross for my sin and your sin. If I come into his presence with dirty hands or an impure heart or having offended somebody, what, whatever it is, if I come into his presence and I don't ask for forgiveness, I'm, I'm coming in an unworthy manner. Um, that that line reminds me of when we partake of the Lord's Supper. Um, when we do not, you know, in every worship service we have a, time, a prayer of confession. That is never sufficient for me. I'm glad we have it. But I need more than that. Uh, and so every day, if I could still get on my knees, I would be on my knees confessing my sins. And only Jesus Christ can cleanse us from sin and put us in a right relationship with God and fill us with his spirit so that we can love each other and we can serve Christ. Um, we offend a lot of people when we say there is only, there's only one way to God and that's through Jesus Christ. But that is exactly what the scripture says. <laughs> And we cannot refrain from saying that and preaching that because we don't want to offend. And a lot of us want to be politically correct, so we're not going to say these things. Yes, Ken. Uh, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity all say we worship the God of Abraham. But Christianity says we worship God, the Father of Jesus Christ. Right. The do not they do not. They do not. A it's a and it's it's a huge distinct, a distinction, and we and we can't wiggle out of that so that we don't offend somebody. The gospel is an offense to those who do not believe, unless the Spirit is working in their heart, and we will get a nudge from the Spirit when it's time. You know, I've known some people for ages, and but there is a time that comes. When I feel the moving of the Spirit, now is the time. Go ahead, explain who Jesus is. Not everyone is willing to hear it or will believe it. But, but the Spirit will work. And when the Lord is working on someone to bring that person into his family, one of us is going to get that nudge. Go ahead, share the gospel. But we better be sure we know the gospel. Uh, there is no other way of salvation. There is no other way to be forgiven of sins than through Jesus Christ. 
but I don't know of any other, there are no other religions of the world that will acknowledge the efficacy of Jesus' blood on the cross for the religious sins. Do any of the others acknowledge the Holy Spirit? That, that part of the Trinity? I don't know of any. Do you, any of you? You know, it's, it, it, if you, even if you go to Genesis 1-1, uh, you find all three members of the Trinity at work there in, in, in creation. But, but a lot of people don't have an idea of who the Spirit is. Uh, and, and so you hear these comments, but we all worship the same God. We don't. We don't. You cannot slice Jesus out of the Trinity and still worship the same God. You can't do it. You can yeah. On what I said, Judaism says the Messiah has not come. Yeah. Islam says in Surah 19 that it is an abomination to say that God had a son. So we're gonna we're and gonna. They all say we're the God of Abraham. So you've got to make that distinction. We are God, the Father of Jesus Christ. You're absolutely right. Now, the question I always ask myself is, when is the right time to give that definitive, clear witness for Jesus Christ? Um, I will tell you how George and I handle it with our, our Jewish orthopedic surgeon. We love him dearly, and he knows that, and he loves us. And so I try to acknowledge the Jewish uh, special days holy days to him. I don't get much time to talk to him about Christ, but I've had more surgeries with him than I could count. And George is always there wanting to pray before surgery, and so he says, Dr. Harris, come on in. We want to have prayer. And he always says the same thing. I'll accept all the help from the Almighty that I can get. He will never say God. And so we join hands around the bed. And I love that moment because I say, Jesus, is now the time I'm going to see you. I hope so. But it hasn't worked yet. But, it, <laughs> but, but, but anyway, we include him in that circle of prayer. And it gives us a bond. I presume when George or I die, he might be in, in, in one of our pews at that service. We have a good relationship with him. Um, someday... The Spirit's going to take the blindness from his eyes, and he's going to understand who Jesus is. But now is not the time. And I'm not worried about that. My responsibility is to be a witness to him in every way I possibly can. And he has never said to me, but we all worship the same God. He knows we worship Jesus Christ. So... We, are, we don't have the answer for everybody as they want to hear it, but we are all called to go out into this world and be a witness. And when we're being led of the Holy Spirit, that witness will be effective. You may never know it. Somebody may bring it to mind later. The Spirit might bring it to mind. But we are all called to leave this place and go out and be a witness to our friends and neighbors. And the Spirit will guide us. The Spirit will strengthen us. It is the Spirit who convinces us of sin. Um, we might be, have the privilege of leading people to Christ, and they may not choose to come to First Press, but might want to go to First Baptist. God bless them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so we are one body in Christ. We go by a lot of different names, a lot of different denominations, but we belong to Christ and therefore we are united with each other. And we should praise God for that and do all we can to encourage each other. It's time to leave and go get lunch wherever you're going. So let's close in prayer. Lord, how can we thank you enough for dying for us? Lord, we thank you that we are your children, that we are bound to you eternally, that we are part of your church. And because we belong to you, your church will, <clears throat> will always be, and we will always be united to each other. And we will always serve you together. 
But Lord, there's some here from other churches and that matters not because there is only one church. Your scripture makes that clear. And that is the church where you plant us. It's part being part of your body so that not only are our sins forgiven by your blood, but we are empowered by your Holy Spirit to do your work in whatever local church that happens to be. We thank you that you would call us to serve you. Now, Lord, as we part from each other, we pray for safety and we pray that your spirit will bring the words of scripture back to us again and again and again, reminding us that it is not a denomination that holds us or divides us. It is you and our belief in you and our ties with each other through your blood. So help us to share this good news. Fill us with your spirit. Give us a hunger for your word. Give us a dedication to prayer and to service. In Jesus' name we pray.